And now I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on leadership and development, business acumen for leaders. I'm going to hand things over to our featured presenter today. He is executive leadership coach and professional development consultant, Mr. Brian Ackles. Brian, you now have the floor. Kelly, thank you very much. And uh, everybody, welcome to this to this webinar. This is this is a topic which is uh, it's a bit difficult to understand from from the title. So uh, let's jump in and look at what our objectives are, and that'll start helping to set the stage for what we're talking about when we refer to business acumen. So by the end of this webinar, um, what I'm aiming for is that there will be a general recognition of the importance of big picture thinking in business planning, uh, gaining an overview of the decision-making criteria for organizations, and also appreciate how business etiquette and ethics affect your organizational success. So with that in mind, um, let's jump into a bit of a definition about what do we actually mean by business acumen. So loosely defined, it's your ability to assess external markets and make effective decisions. But it's not just external markets, it's also being able to assess um, all the internal pieces as well. So you're looking at being able to integrate data, integrate data to achieve the results that you need to have. And this integration of data requires that you have a, a, a certain knowledge and understanding about what's going on. So you need to understand finance, you need to understand strategy, you need to understand decision making. And it's not just about understanding it, it's, it's, it's actually more about in being able to internalize this and take all of this information and make decisions. So you're making business decisions based on, on, on a myriad of inputs. It's coming at you from, from every direction. And these decisions really affect how the business operates, right? So you're, you're looking at the costs, the profit margins, cash flow, market position, competition, et cetera. So business acumen is, is really the, the holistic term for all of the information that you as a manager and that you as a leader have access to uh, and that you use to make effective decisions. And that's really what we're going to talk about today, is how you put all of this together. So every business deals with both short and long-term interactions. So when we start looking at the big picture of, of running a business and making decisions, we need to consider both of these types of interactions, long-term and short-term. So if we look at short-term interactions first, so these are, these, are the, these are the ones that we do on a day-by-day -day basis. So these are you know, your, your customer interactions, the sales calls, uh, dealing with inventory concerns, dealing with uh, project execution, project management, um, dealing with the details on a day-to-day -day operation of an organization and of a business, of, of a division, of a region, et cetera. That's the short term. When you consider the big picture, you also have to consider how the short term interactions impact the larger picture and, and, and the longer view of the organization. So the example that we have on the slide here is talking about you know, aggressive sales techniques. Well, if you're too aggressive in your sales, you may damage your customer relationships and you may achieve the sale today, but you're not gonna have any future business with, with the customer. And as any business owner will tell you, and as any, as any executive will tell you, particularly in sales, uh, it's not about the sale. It's about the relationship, and it's about generating ongoing business, becoming a partner with your customers. So keeping that in mind, look at all of your short-term interactions. The same can be said for you know, issues that you have within projects, uh, how you communicate with your customers, how you deal with problems when you're shipping something out to a customer um, and it doesn't arrive, uh, how you actually deal with that interaction as well. So all of these imp have an implication on the bigger picture and the longer-term interactions. So when we talk about the longer term interactions, what we're actually talking about is the relationships. The relationships that you're building both inside and outside the organization to, and out, to enable you to grow and to be successful. So these require you know, a longer view of the world. It's it's not about going out and making a sales call and if you don't get the if you don't make the sale that day, well, you can always go out and make another sales call tomorrow. 
you know, in, in when you're talking about sales and you're talking about uh, customer interactions and account management, it's about building a relationship. It's about understanding what organizations need, what business challenges, you know, your customers are facing, uh, how you can potentially affect that. And that's just on the sales side. But it's also cultivating relationships with your vendors. How do you deal with your supply chain? How how are your vendors hooked into your business? Do they understand your needs, uh, your drives, how your season, what how your business works seasonally? Uh, what happens when something isn't received from a vendor or when there's a problem with a vendor? How does that relationship work? How will they resolve all of this? Uh, this is typical if you're if you're purchasing anything from anybody this is a, a challenge that you need to have is to build that relationship uh, I'll give you an example I've, I've been on both sides of the of the vendor and customer fence and, I, and I'm currently on the customer fence on the customer side of the equation and I've just finished uh, managing and, and dealing with a very large program of work from a very large multinational vendor and I, I came from the large multinational vendor side previous, previous to this current position that I'm working with now. When I started this whole program three and a half years ago, one of the things that I started out talking to this organization about, talking to the vendor about, was how important it was going to be that we develop a really strong and close relationship built on respect uh, and built on mutual success. And you know there were there were certainly some hiccups along the way, and there were some challenges before we figured out how to how to deal with each other. But I can honestly say that at the end of the program of work, both this vendor and the company, uh, the company that I work with, both know that this was one of the most successful projects we've uh, that any of us have been involved in, which is somewhat unique in the industry that I'm in. Which is in this particular case, it was a communications system that we were uh, that we were we were replacing. So these relationships can start by talking about and having a fundamental discussion about respect. If you don't cultivate good relationships, the, the flip side of this is, is, is tragedy. Uh, when I was on the vendor side of the equation, um, I, I dealt with customers who, no matter what we as a vendor did, took a very antagonistic approach, took a very confrontational approach, um, and it was a very difficult interaction over a number of years. Now, we were the vendor, we had to support our customer, absolutely, but it made the whole process difficult for everybody involved. It made it difficult for the customer, it made it difficult for the customer staff, it made it difficult certainly for us as a vendor, uh, it made it difficult for our large organization, and it made it difficult for you know our suppliers as well. Long-term relationships are really is what's going to take you into the future. And getting to these long-term relationships, again, you require to have this, this holistic understanding of your business, the market that you're in, your customer's business, and what the future is going to look like potentially for that interaction between you and your customer and your vendors, your staff, etc. And this is really what, what business acumen is really all about. So a lot of this is you're making decisions. Um, and, you know, you make decisions every day. Now, when we start talking about mindful decisions, you're looking at decisions which have a bit more importance, that they're, they're a bit more import to the company. So oftentimes you're having to make, you know, critical business decisions under stress. And you need to recognize what that situation is doing to your ability to make effective decisions. So look at how your emotions affect how you make decisions, how external pressure affects how you make decisions. Recognize the events that have made you in the past make less than good decisions. I won't say poor decisions. Every decision is, is, is good, whether it's good in the short term or good as a learning experience. But look at where you can improve your decision making by recognizing what external events have led you to more challenging decisions than not. So when we talk about mindful decision making, this combines the you know pure reason, logic, but it also combines intuition. Intuition is that is that trait 
that that we develop with experience. Right? We we learn things throughout our career. We've learned things throughout our life, and all of these things juggle around in our head, and that becomes part of our intuition, and this becomes a factor in how we make decisions based on where we are at a particular point in time, like today. So some of the, st the steps to making good decisions, good mindful decisions. Gather the information that you have. And, and this, this is the reason, this is the rational, logical piece that you need to have. Gather the information you need to make a decision. Gather the financial numbers, gather uh, information on, on, on resource availability, gather information on, on market trends, on, on future, on, on the competitive landscape. Right? Gather all of the, the pure information that you need. But then listen to your intuition. What does your experience tell you, coupled with all of this information that you have? And then make your decision. But write your decision down. But don't act on it straight away. Give yourself some time to consider the decision. Acting rashly can have serious consequences in the long term. So take some time to consider your decision. Mull it over. You know, the, the, the term, you know, sleep on it really does help you we've probably all experienced this you, you, you think about doing something uh, before you go to bed you wake up in the morning and go maybe that's not such a good idea or maybe it's a great idea and you've really confirmed that and you know as you're sleeping your mind is, is going through this and it's your intuition it's your experience which is also matching with the information that you you come up with in terms of reason and logic if you're comfortable making the decision, once you're comfortable making the decision, then act on it. And this is a mindful decision. You're not making a snap judgment. You're making a decision based on information and based on your intuition. So all of this about decision. Understand that everything in an organization, every business role, every part of the business is related to each other. So if you think about the business roles that exist within your organization, and these are places where you're gathering information from, understand that you know, your production group and your custo and customer service obviously affect sales. If, if your production is having challenges and your customer service is uh, not up to uh, industry standard or is, is, it's not exceeding your customer's expectation, then this can have direct impacts on your profits, on your reputation in the marketplace, uh, on your reputation within the industry. Every single person, every single role in your organization affects how the organization is viewed. And I cannot stress that enough. From the person that answers the phone to the person that keeps the building and keeps your facilities clean. And every, every person in between has an effect and has an impact on how you work. So understanding all of that, understanding that there is an interrelationship between every part of the business, understand also that the leadership of the company is ultimately responsible for the culture and values within the organization. The culture and values are really what's going to guide all of the different aspects of the business in terms of marketing, your finance, governance, information, and people, uh, how they're reflected. Uh, I'm, I'm in a, a public safety uh, facing organization right now, and, and our basic mantra or basic bottom line is to protect lives and save property. That's why we exist today. That is what we do. And every, that is our company value. So that's our simple value statement. The culture of the organization is driven that everything that we do has an impact on public safety. So everything we do has to have a, a very high uh, margin or a very high uh, excellence. We're, we're looking at you know, five and six nines of, uh, of uptime for technology. Uh, and all of this comes into how we make decisions and what type of decisions we actually make. So these are all part of culture and values. So as we move through this whole process of, of looking at decisions and understanding how each part of the business is related to each other, uh, we start getting into the idea that, you know, how complex this thing is in terms of being able to manage a business. Now, 
we talk about running a business and running an enterprise. Well, it's also about you know looking at your leadership of a division, leadership of your team, leadership of a group of people. All of this still requires that you have the ability to look at the big picture. And fundamental to all of this is being able to have an answer to some basic financial questions about your organization or about what you are responsible for. It's definitely not enough that only your accountant knows this or that only the finance department knows this. You as a leader, you as a manager need to have a, a, an understanding of all of this. Now, I'm gonna preface this next bit of the discussion by stating very clearly, I am not a financial professional. Okay. I look at this, I look at information, and uh, I look at the financial information that I need to know, and I have learned enough about how to do this, and, and that's key. We can all learn enough about how the finances in an organization works. You need to be aware of the financial parts of your organization. You need to understand how this guides your company and how it guides it to success. So fundamentally, how do we make money? You, you need to understand how does your company, how does your organization make money? What is your, imp what is your input to that? The purpose of a business, of a for-profit business, is to make a profit. Okay? Some, simple as that. You need to make money in order to survive. If you don't make money, you close the doors. But you have to understand what actually makes us money. So you look at your products and you look at your services and you figure out which ones are actually making us money, which ones are actually, and it's, I don't want to focus too much, too much on the money here, which ones are making us money, but also which ones are important to us to have or which products and services do we need to have to remain in this business space? And that's an important question because not all of the time is it about the pure money part of a product or a service. As long as you're not losing money on it or losing too much money, and that's a decision that, that, that is made at the corporate level, depending on, on where you need to be. You, you make decisions on understanding all of this, understanding your, your product makeup. And it's a simple example here. So a bakery. Bakery makes three products, croissant, cookies, and cakes. So croissants make up 80% of the sales. Cakes make up 15% of the sales and cookies make up 5%. And as the slide says, you know, some days they throw a lot of the cookies out. But why would an organization continue to make cookies if they're a bakery? And that's the fundamental question. Perhaps in this market space for this particular bakery, the cookies are kind of a lost leader. Right? They come in, they have cookies out on, you know, pieces of cookies out on the counter. People can try them. They're not a big selling item. But they do bring people in, and it does show that yet yeah, we are a bakery. We have a number of products for sale. Right? So again, it may be that although cookies make up very little of this, and, and you look for the cookies in your own organization, you know they might make up a small part of your sales, but they might be important to the overall business that you're in. So when you're looking at the financial aspects of an organization, you need to look beyond the pure profit motive beyond the pure, well, we make so much money out of this, we should concentrate only on that. Because then you, you might be missing other opportunities to grow in different areas. So perhaps this, this bakery you know, might look at all of this and say, well, how can we make our cookies, how can we increase the sales of our cookies? You know, how do we investigate, or how do we determine why our customers aren't buying our cookies? Why are we throwing so many of them out? Perhaps it'll be a recipe change. Perhaps it'll be a different way of marketing the cookies. Right. And again, look for the cookies in your own organization and look for ways to uh, enable those to enhance the organization. So understand, again, from the, from the financial aspect, what were your sales last year? Um, how, much, how much did you sell last year? So growth is required to stay competitive. If you don't grow, your competitors are. Right? Growth means that you're expanding your market share, um, you're either building new markets or you're gaining market share from your competitors. So understanding sales results year over year is sort of fundamental to understanding the status of the organization that you're working with. So I mean, a very simple example, if you have one year sales of $90,000 and next year sales of $100,000, um, 
you do the math and it's you know it, it works out to about an 11 percent increase in your sales year over year which is not too bad um, but you have to understand that you know you're looking for growth now if the if the numbers were, were reversed and you know you're looking at it from the, the flip side and you you know you made a hundred thousand last year and only ninety thousand this year again you do the math and you'll see that you'll have a decrease in sales and you you start looking at well why were our sales lower what's happened what sort of mechanisms we have to put in place or are we looking at a longer term picture are we looking at more of a three to five year spread in our sales not just a year over year issue and again these are the types of questions which you start to ask once you start to have the information about the finances and about other aspects of the organization this is again all part of your sort of holistic business acumen so then you look at your profit margin okay so you make money you make sales but that doesn't necessarily equate to profit so the profit indicates how well your company is running so typically large companies make you know 13 percent net profit net profit margins um, perhaps a lot higher gross profit uh, but by the time, we'll, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more. And the higher the profit margin, the more efficient the business is being run. But there's a balance. There's a balance against efficiency and being too lean to be able to react to new opportunities. So again, this is this is part of the balancing act you play within operating uh, operating a business to say, okay, our our margin is really good, our net profit is really good. It means we're really efficient, but you know, can we afford maybe to be a little bit less efficient to concentrate on uh, looking at growing the business in, the, in this particular area? Again, you know, again, looking back to your cookies, right? maybe it's time to put some more energy and put some more efforts and resources, uh, you know, decrease your profit, your net profit margin a little bit to allow you to explore new ways of, of expanding your organization and growing your organization within, within, your, uh, within your sphere. So there are again, there's two types of profit margin. There's there's gross profit and there's net profit. So gross profit is really it's it's your sales amount less the cost of what you've sold, either the cost of the goods produced or or your cost of sales. Your net profit takes into account other parts of other costs within the organization. So it includes the cost of goods sold. It also includes your operating expenses. It includes interest uh, that you may be paying, uh, other administrative costs. It includes your taxes. So all of these become costs which you then apply to get your net profit. And it's not nearly as simplistic as this. Uh, and this is why we have you know strong strong accounting groups and strong financial teams within organization. But at a at a very high level, that's the difference between your sort of your, your gross profit, which is really sales numbers less what it costs you to create the good or service and net profits are everything including all other expenses against your sales numbers as well and that that difference will tell you how much you're spending to operate the organization to actually create the sales so again all of this comes back to financial literacy so you're you're you see the importance of understanding the numbers of the organization and you see the importance of being able to have that information as part of your decision making process particularly you know you're making mindful decisions based on inputs so what are some of those inputs well some of the other inputs are the financial reports and the financial information that your company generates uh, on, on regular intervals so you look at the, you need to understand and have the ability to read the, these different reports. And we're going to talk about three of them briefly. We're going to talk about an income statement, we'll talk about a balance sheet, and we'll talk about cash flow statements. Okay, these are the internal reports that your organization must create uh, to meet financial and legal obligations. So they have to be able to report on all of this. So, again, all of this information, internal information, matches up with your external information to help you make decisions. So let's talk about the income statement. So the income statement lets you see how much you've made in a, in a particular period. Now usually income statements are generated interim, so an inter, interim income statement is generated quarterly and then you get an annual income statement at the end of your, at the end of your fiscal year. So it shows information on the sales, gross revenue, cost of goods sold, your gross profit margin, 
operating expenses. Um, so each expense, what does it actually cost you to operate? And, and if you look at the larger the organization, the more complex your operating expense becomes. Your net profit. If you're a publicly uh, traded company, it also identifies the earnings per share. Uh, and also any other expenses and income. So you may have investment income, you may have tax liabilities, um, you may have you know real estate costs, etc., which also are shown in the income statement. So it, it wraps all of this, all of these numbers up into into one particular statement. And I'm not going to go through the actual details of a statement in the, in the webinar. Next in this this list of financial reports is the balance the balance sheet. So the balance sheet shows you where you're at at a particular time by showing your assets, your liability, and your current equity within the organization. So this basically tells you how healthy you are from a financial perspective within the organization. So typical items on the balance sheet, your current assets. So what are your actual liquid assets? What could you turn into cash? Or what is cash? What do you actually have in terms of cash? Your total assets. Uh, which is your longer term investments, perhaps. Your current liabilities. Your current liabilities include you know, your payroll, uh, your, your, uh, invoice, your outstanding uh, payments to vendors, your outstanding, uh, any, any outstanding payment that you have, any outstanding liability, uh, lease costs, et cetera. And then equity, which is the difference between your liabilities and your assets. And then in terms of publicly traded companies, you get into the idea of stockholders' equity which again, uh, I'm not going to delve into. It becomes a very large and, and, and complex discussion uh, on, on how all of this changes or how all of this fits within publicly traded companies. And there's lots of legislative and legal requirements, and I don't want to get myself in too much trouble here. And then we look at the cash flow statement. So this provides you information on how much money was generated and how it was used. So they contain usually the three most recent reports from the three most recent periods. And it depends on your organization what those periods will be. So there's some items on your cash flow statement. So it's net cash used by your operating activities, net cash uh, used or provided by your investing activities, and net cash used or provided by your financing expenses. So your cash, your net increase or decrease is made up of adding up all of these. So your net ca cash from operations, investments, and financing. Um, and that will tell you whether you have a net increase or a net decrease in your cash position. So you always begin this cash flow statement, though, with the net income from the income statement. And the cash flow statement ends with the cash equivalent, which is at the beginning of the balance sheet. So you see how all of these three uh, financial reports actually linked together. They're, none of them are done in isolation. And in the full uh, in the full uh, business acumen course, it actually goes through and goes through this in a lot more details with a lot more concrete examples. So, like I prefaced all of this discussion off about financial literacy, uh, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I'm not trained in, in business finance. Uh, I have taken courses on this. Uh, I have spent a lot of time in business and I, I've been exposed to this. I talked to our financial, our financial group and I've talked to my, our, my financial functions in different companies. You can learn and you can learn about this. There's, there's tons of information, books, online publications. Um, if you're, you are, look to government websites to make sure that you're meeting all of your uh, legal obligations. Look at blogs and different websites. Look at different databases of information. Talk to your internal people. Talk to your internal financial people. They will be more than happy to help you understand the information and the, the balance sheets that they're actually creating and walk you through them. Um, so you can learn. That's the bottom line. If you, if you don't feel comfortable in this, and if you feel that you need to learn more, Go to go out and find ways to do it. So that's really been talking about what we have in terms of the inputs that we take, the raw material inputs that we take to build decisions. So we look at uh, the financial aspects of the business, and we've talked about our intuition. We've talked about our, about our experience. But there's more to business acumen than just that. 
So it's also looking at resources and looking at your internal resources, the people actually, we talked all on the resources, the people that make up your organization. We all know that managing people is a very complex endeavor. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions and, and then there's a lot of courses and there's a lot of education around developing your skills to become an effective manager and an effective leader. Part of being, part of having a good grasp of business acumen is being an effective manager and developing your management skills because your management skills have a direct result on the results of your organization. You don't do this in isolation. Your work is, a, is, is done by the people that report to you. You're providing leadership to them. You're taking their inputs to help you make decisions on where to take the organization. So management skills in this are really, really key. So understanding all that, it's a very broad topic and I'm not gonna go into it, into it in any great detail. There are a lot of great programs and courses out there from New Horizons uh, which, which walk you through uh, management and walk you through different, different aspects of management learning and management skills. One of the things I will talk though is about critical thinking. We've talked and I've talked a lot about, you know, this, this massive information that is coming at you from inside and outside of the organization. Right? You're constantly looking at the external market. You're looking at uh, the competitive landscape. You're looking at your customers. You're, you're in dialogue with different, with your vendors. Uh, you're going to trade shows. You're going to, uh, you're reaching out to pretty much everybody that is involved with what you do and you're gathering information, you're subscribing to journals, you're, you're getting synopsis in your emails every day from different parts of, uh, different parts, uh, of your organization and from external sources. So all of this information is, is coming at you and you need to be able to analyze this critically because if you're not careful with this information, it can lead you down the road to a, to a, a, a less good decision. Again, I'm trying to call, not call them bad decisions. So in terms of critical thinking, you need to ask some pretty particular questions. So information that you're getting, is there assumptions that are inherent in the information that you're getting or is it verified? Is this information true? And this is, this is the whole fake news. Is what you're receiving accurate and is it true? Is it verified or is it assumed to be correct? And I can give you a very simple example of this. We've all driven down the streets in, in, in the towns and cities that we live in. Uh, best, uh, best sushi in Vancouver. I see signs outside of a sushi restaurant. The first question that goes through my mind is, according to whom? This is an assumption. Unless it's been voted on, unless there's been you know, some empirical measure, it's only the assumption that that's the best sushi in Vancouver. So identify what these assumptions are and identify whether information is verified. Look at the perspectives. Look at, you know, how somebody views something. Is there another way to view a particular piece of information? So you receive a report that a customer has just laid off or a vendor, say a vendor has just laid off a thousand people and, and they have a, they have a 15,000 person workforce. So they lay off one fifteenth of their workforce, which is a pretty significant number. So one perspective of this is, wow, they seem to be having problems. You know, why, why are they suddenly laying off so many people? That's, that, that, that can't be good. Maybe we should be uh, looking for other vendors, but maybe look at it from another perspective. Uh, maybe they're laying off these thousand people because they're they're rationalizing their organization and they're trying to streamline their business and they've made the hard decisions about getting out of certain products and services that they were offering uh, and it's necessitated a downsizing of their workforce now the thing is you have to you have to be able to find out why something has happened so again you're looking at your assumptions and you're looking at different perspectives so examine the evidence of why something occurred and again, it's, it's about evidence and it's about verification. Um, understand or attempt to understand what somebody is telling you or what something, what a piece of information actually is. Somebody tells you something, it, it's, it's not a bad thing to make sure you're clear 
and that you understand what they're saying. I'm not certain what you mean by that statement. Can you expand on it? Or if I hear you correctly, are, are you saying this? And you know, you can, you're paraphrasing and sending it back to them. So make sure you've got a clear understanding and make sure you're, you're, you're using all the tools that you've got and all of your avenues of communication to ensure that you have a clear understanding of the picture and you're not basing it again on assumptions uh, and on, on misinformation, if you will. Also look at the implications of the information that you have. A lot of the information that you get um, is irrelevant. I get stuff that comes across my inbox every day uh, about, you know, uh, security systems. Uh, a lot of it right now is around security systems and, and, you know, moving into a secure cloud environment or network security. It, it's, it certainly is the watchword of, of the technology industry these days. A lot of this and most of this stuff is not relevant to the work that I do. Okay, I'm responsible for operations of our, of, of our communication systems, our wireless and, and wired communication systems in the organization. That is my responsibility as in, within where I work today. I, although I'm interested in the technology evolutions of different parts of, of what's happening in the industry, uh, it's not relevant to the decision making that I need to make on today, this week, next month, or this year, you know, looking out into a further time frame. So understand the importance of the information you have and, and how the implications it has on your decisions. So again, critical thinking. So question, for the example here, is, is question statistics. You, you, you receive a statistic from somebody. Eight out of 10 people agree that drinking coffee can stain your teeth. Well, who says this? Who are these eight people? How was the study created? Is this just somebody pick up the phone and called, you know, 100 people, came up with 80 people out of 100, said that coffee stains your teeth? Thanks very much. Well, that's a statistic then. But is that a credible source? Was there any testing? Was there any before and after? Um, so again, you think about the source of information. Is this real? Does this actually make sense? Where does this information come from? So this is critical thinking, and you, you have to take the time to do this, particularly when you're making larger business decisions, understand the implications, understand where information is coming from. So you evaluate the information, you evaluate it based on factor opinion, you look at it in terms of bias, uh, where it's coming from, is it only a limited viewpoint or is it, is it, a, broad, is it a broad viewpoint? Um, and is it relevant? Is it applicable to the, to the decision that you need to make? So this is all part of the evaluation, part of critical thinking. Think about the impacts of your decisions. How will it affect the company? How will it affect the customers? How will it affect your staff? Um, what is the impact on long-term and short-term? We'll go right back to the beginning. Is, it, is this only a short-term thing which has a negative long-term impact? Or is it a long-term impact um, that we may have some challenges short term with, but we're we're making this decision so we can achieve our long term goals and, uh, and meet our you know, look at our strategic uh, our strategic positioning in the marketplace. Of the options that you've got available, is this the best decision that you can make? And last but not least, are you comfortable making this decision? Is this the right decision? And asking the question, are you comfortable? Am I comfortable making this decision? Uh, what you're actually accessing at this point is your intuition. You've gathered the information, you've looked at it critically, um, you've evaluated the information, you've answered these questions about impact. Finally, you're saying, am I, am I good with this? And if the answer is yes, make the decision. So, all of this leveraging decisions, leveraging information, right? You look at also leveraging the information from the organization itself. We've talked about the people, the people who make up your organization, but we've also, you also need to leverage the customers of your products and services. Understand that they have sources of information as well. Where do they see the market going? Where do they see um, their performance? You know, what are, how are they growing? Uh, are your customers in a declining market themselves? And how is that gonna affect your future business? 
um, how are the what are the processes used to manage the organization? Are they flexible? Are they are they really adaptable? Are they flexible? Are they agile, or are they very staid and are they very sort of old fashioned? Do they need to be updated? Do you need to become a bit more dynamic? Uh, and also look at the overall goals of the organization. So we look at goal alignment within the organization. It always starts off with you know the strategic corporate goals. So at the top of the pyramid. Right? There's, a, there's an organizational strategy which uh, companies spend a lot of time and a lot of money developing, you know, the, the three to five year strategic plan. That then translates down into your regional goals, divisional goals, department goals, team goals. And this all depends on, on how your organization is structured. The words, the words uh, you know, will change depending on, on where you work. But it fundamentally comes down to your individual goals and team goals have to have a direct relationship back to the corporate goals. It, everything has to support what's happening at the top. And you'll notice that this is very clearly identified in a pyramid for a very good reason. The individual goals are the foundation upon which the corporate goals will be achieved. And that's a very important piece as a manager and as a leader you have to ensure that the individual goals that your staff has and as they roll up through the team goals, department goals, et cetera, that all of those goals are rolling up to support the corporate goals. If your individual team members' goals are not directly supporting the corporate goals, you would start to question why you're doing something or why you're having that person, why that goal is assigned to that person. So it's, again, something to think about in terms of your goal alignment. Part of having goals and part of having goal alignment is also looking at the ethical obligations of your organization. And there are certain fundamental ethics within organizations. You need to treat your employees ethically. And that's beyond the national and, and legal requirements. So you have a moral obligation to pay back your investors and to meet the needs of your shareholders. If you borrow money or if somebody invests in your organization for growth, it is your obligation, it's your moral and ethical obligation to pay these people back. You need to build ethical customer relationships. You provide safe products and you honor the warranties that you have. You provide good customer service. You have an ethical obligation to be involved in the communities that you work in. And this is not just the community where your office is, but it's the communities where you interact with your customers. So if you are a large multinational, you have an ethical obligation to operate and to have an impact and be involved in the local communities that you touch within your sphere of influence. And you have an ethical obligation to deal with vendors ethically and with other organizations that you work with. Now, the challenge with ethics, of course, is that you know we see different communications devices and different ways of, of dealing with information that is having an effect on how we view ethics. So one of the things we're, we're constantly struggling with in organizations is this view of personal privacy. Uh, social media is becoming a challenge to the idea of personal privacy. A lot of organizations monitor people, your employees' social networks. And looking at your behavior, looking at you know, their employees' behavior on their social network as having an impact on their work and on their business how they actually work within the business and how the business is viewed because of their personal um, activity on social media. Um, employees use social media to find more out about colleagues and, and customers. Uh, I walked into a meeting last week and the, one of the first things that was said to me, yeah, I, I looked you up on LinkedIn. I wanted to have a better idea of who you were before I came to the meeting. And I'll be honest with you, that really didn't surprise me because I do it all the time. If I'm going to meet with people and I haven't met them before, but I have their names and I know where they work, I'll use social media and LinkedIn, I find is a great tool for this for business um, to actually find out a little bit about them, about their background. Bottom line is with, in terms of ethics, you have an ethical responsibility to your staff to have very clear policies in place regarding social media use and the expectations that you have on their social media use and the impacts of that use on how they're viewed within the organization. Finally, we're gonna talk just for a couple of minutes about business etiquette. 
Well, again, all of this ties back into you know, this holistic picture of business acumen. So everything we do in terms of, uh, everything we do reflects on our company and our products, right? So branding is everything. So you act professionally. And if you act professionally in, in every aspect of what you're doing, that sends a very clear message about your business that you're credi credible and trustworthy. Customer care, again, part of good business etiquette. You treat people well. You talk to any organizer, you have to talk to anybody about their interactions with customer service, and they'll either say, nah, it was horrible, or yeah, it was great. There's very little, yeah, it was all right. People either love customer care or hate your customer care. So it's important that you actually have the systems and, and, and processes in place to provide really good customer care to, you, to your customers. Also look at employee engagement and treating people and your employees professionally. This is about you know, improving morale and confidence within your employees. And it also helps your employees you know, do a better job for you. And it builds working relationships. It builds smooth, smoother relationships. It builds uh, innovation within organization. Uh, and there, there's, a whole, there's a whole hours long discussion on employee engagement, but it again, you have an ethical or good business etiquette requires that you actually focus on this as well. Focus on good employee engagement. So other aspects of business etiquette is about how you communicate, how you communicate by email, how you communicate by IM, your telephone etiquette. How do you answer the phone? I answer the phone like this. Hi, or Brian Ackles, can I help you? I've answered the phone like that for so many years at work i do it personally as well and you know my friends get just get a, get a real kick out of this because well yes you can help me i'm moving on saturday will you be here at eight um yeah so sometimes there's a downside to being that helpful but you know think about your telephone etiquette uh, there's some people i call to pick up the phone and go hello um, i don't know whether i've reached a business at that point whether i've reached the person i'm trying to get hold of so think about your own personal telephone etiquette. Think about your meeting etiquette. Do you allow people to use their cell phones in meetings to check messages, to check emails, take calls, etc.? Think about the rules and think about meeting etiquette. Think about your own actions in meetings. And also think about your interactions with customers. All of this comes down to, again, branding and how you're viewed within the organization. So your customer interactions take, you know, a huge, it's, they, they run the gamut now. I mean, you're talking about email, telephone exchanges, face-to-face -face social media interactions, uh, inside and outside of business hours. Um, of particular care and attention when it comes to business etiquette is social interactions outside of business hours. So understand, first of all, the culture of where you're meeting with somebody, the, the, the actual national culture. Understand that you're representing your organization at all times during the time that you're actually engaged in a social interaction with your customer. Despite what they may be doing, you are still always representing your organization. Um, and you need, if you don't understand the culture that you're working in, if you're uh, visiting a, a country that you've never been into before, uh, it's nothing wrong with asking your colleagues at, at within the organization, uh, asking the customer what is appropriate. Uh, and that will, that will go a long ways to smoothing interactions that uh, you may uh, get wrong in terms of uh, missing culture. So let's put this all together. So you've got to keep a view on the big picture. You've got to understand your customers. You have to understand the measures you need to create, key performance indicators so you measure what counts. You need to understand the financial health of your organization. You need to understand and make decisions ethically, basing your decisions on good empirical data, but also basing your decisions on intuition and apply critical thinking skills to that information. And understand that business etiquette has a huge impact on how you are perceived, both professionally inside and outside your organization, but also how the organization is perceived as well. So all of this is wrapped up to the term of business acumen. The more of these skills and the more of these tools that you use, the greater your degree of business acumen that you have within your organization. So with that, I will say thank you, uh, and I hope to see you or, or talk to you again shortly. And at this point, I'll pass it back to Kelly.
Thank you so much, Brian. And if any of you have any questions on today's topic, uh, please feel free to type those now and we will ask Brian those questions over audio. I want to thank you all for attending today. Um, today's session has been recorded, so I will send you all the recording link later today to review yourself or pass on to any colleagues who were unable to join. Just a quick note on the Business Acumen for Leaders um, course that we are offering. It is a two-day course um, and we do have an upcoming uh, schedule for uh, June 14th. So um, those that should attend this session would be professionals desiring to improve their business planning, financial management, and decision-making skills, and practice them in an ethical and professional manner. Um, certain job roles that would attend this would be personal development, uh, leader of teams and projects, leader of managers and departments, or leader of organizational strategy. So um, if you fit into any of those uh, or want further information on this course offering, please visit our website at newhorizons.com. You can uh, find all of this information under our Center for Leadership and Development. And Brian, it looks like we don't have any questions, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up today's presentation. Uh, thank you so much for presenting on behalf of New Horizons. Great. Not a problem. My pleasure. All right. And thanks again, everyone, for attending. We'll be in touch later today. Thanks so much. Have a great day.